George Kilpatrick, inspiration for the nation, celebrating people we feel good about. Abraham Masara is in the house, licensed therapist. Tell me what your business is, Mr. Masara. How you doing, Brother GK? Uh, so I'm actually a board-certified psychiatric nurse practitioner, uh, owner and founder of iView, which is our private practice. We do uh, therapy and medication management, um, suboxone, you know, uh, uh, substance use disorders, um, and everything in between. Um, and then I also have a non-for-profit where we try to do some community work. So we've been in practice going on, wow, nine years now, through the grace of God. So psychiatric nurse practitioner. Abortion, so, correct. Yeah, so so that means that you not only you can write scripts and things of that nature, but uh, correct? Yep, correct. And, yep, and we, you, but you also provide the therapeutic piece. Talk to me about that. So yes and no. So when I first started my practice, you know, I didn't have any clients. So I was able to do med management along with therapy, a one-man show. But as things picked up, I had to, uh, you know, get a, a therapy department. So now I just do purely med management. But however, during med management, there is some supportive therapy. It's not just here's a pill. You know, you're listening to the circumstances, their the stressors. And then, you know, we've been trained in therapy. So we do some supportive therapy or some brief CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. But for the most part, I refer them to the therapy department, which we have a pretty uh, strong uh, therapy department right now. We've had a number of suicides in the community, especially of young people. Yeah. So what what do we know? What can be done? And what, what do we need to know that we're missing for uh, why this is happening and why it may, why, why it seems to be more alarming than normal. It, the suicide rates have definitely increased in the last few years. You know, um, our, our world's a little more complicated, you know, since the uh, pandemic, you know, the isolation has definitely caused us distress. I mean, our children, they're really dysregulated since returning uh, back to school. And um, emotional intelligence uh, comes with time. It's not just read a book and learn everything you need to know about your emotions. You know, emotions are complex. Sometimes we're not even able lab, able to label the, the type of emotions that we're feeling. You know what I mean? Um, but what you can do to help protect it, because your, your question was specific, it was children. So um, it's, I mean, it's, and that's because that's what I'm, I, I'm alarmed by that because yeah. You know, we we see young people, you know, we we, you know, a couple of districts, I believe Fayetteville, you know, Baldwinsville, we we're hearing about these things happening. And it used to be that we didn't know how the young person took it, but we, we're seeing that young people are taking um completing suicide. I'm sure that yeah. there have been attempts that we don't really hear about, but you know what you you talk about uh, young people in particular, is there something that we are missing, even in this dysregulated world? This is my opinion, based on my observations, based off, you know, treating young children and so on. Um, you know, the world's evolving faster than our brains. Um, you know, back in our time, GK, you know, keeping up with the Joneses was who lived to the right of you, to the left of you. Nowadays, with social media, keeping up with the Joneses could be as many as a million followers to 10,000 followers. And these these kids, they're developing their confidence, their, their self-esteem, you know, they're strengthening their ego. They're, again, they're, they're, they're evolving and trying to become more intelligent, emotionally intelligent human beings. But that's a process. But with social media, it can disrupt that process because, remember, when these kids post these videos, they're putting their best face forward. They're wearing their best clothing, doing their hair. You know, they want to be influencers. I mean, right, right. yeah, when I ask a child nowadays, what do you want to be when you get older? I don't hear, oh, a doctor or a lawyer or a judge or a police influencer, streamer, a YouTuber. That's, you know, that's what they're aiming for. But anyway, they stick back to the topic. You know, social media definitely plays a role in that in that sense where keeping up with the Joneses is um, it's it, you can't keep up. There's always going to be a new influencer trying to outdo the other. The other thing social media does, and it's more tied into the gadgets, you know, the, the cell phones where people, they, you know, most people use their cell phones as computers and that's where they get their social media content. The cell phone causes isolation. 
That screen time, they're zeroed in on this little screen hours at a time with sound bites of information, quick sound bites. You know, kids are beginning to learn differently. You know, I mean, and I'm 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 even beginning to notice this change in me. You know, um, these TikTok videos or Facebook Reels or Snapchat, you know, they the content is what 30 seconds to a minute tops. And if, you know, God forbid, there's a TikTok reel that's longer than a minute, a minute and 30 seconds. What do we do? We scroll right up. We don't have the patience. You see, so these these these, these short real real videos and these, these small bites of uh, information are where the kids are learning differently now. You know, when my nephew lived with me, the way he was learning was top 10 lists. So if he had a pro history project, you know, let's say for, for, for Greece, you know, just as an example, he would look up a top 10 list of facts about the country of Greece. You know, so they're learning differently. And then also the information that's out there. So what I've been noticing in my practice is, you know, TikTok. And again, I, 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 I talk about TikTok because I, I did explore it. And, 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 you know, it, it has its benefits and, and it has its cons. But you have young adults, you know, 13, 14 year old, sometimes as young as 12, getting on TikTok and discussing diagnoses out of the DSM-5, such as borderline personality disorder, which ties into a uh, uh, high risk population for suicide. And they make these, they glamorize the videos. There's music playing in the background and they, 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 they demonstrate the different symptoms. So like if they want to demonstrate what a mood swing looks like, they'll go, oh, you know, make the little facial gestures and, and it kind of makes it appealing to the kid. And then the kid says to themselves, well, maybe that's what I am then. And they literally come in self-diagnosed. You know, the interesting thing about it, you know, more than a few years ago, mental health was a stigma. People weren't talking about it. Things are changing. People are talking about it. People are a bit open, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of misinformation out there. A lot of misinformation and the kids are easily influenced. Like there's a YouTube channel. I can't remember the, this character's name, but it's a puppet, purple, looks creepy to me, but he's got tons of children following him and he tells he gives the children's challenges that's parallel to self-harm mm. i mean that's where we're at gk mm. you know so social media plays a huge a huge role when it comes to um mood dysregulation depression anxiety you know but are we missing it more today because of this influence I mean, why are we missing it or is it why are we missing it or am i overestimating no you're not again not all suicides you're gonna prevent is the suicide preventable absolutely but you got to keep in mind a good percentage of suicide attempts are an impulsive act you know gk um you know i can't imagine the level of despair emotional pain I mean it may be even physical pain that can drive a person a human being to think that the only way out is to die and it's an impulsive act and it's usually during a moment of despair and distress you know now of course it can progress to suicide it doesn't have to be so impulsive we're talking about mental illness such as depression you know depression can cause you to have suicidal ideations you know, do those ideations turn to plans? Sometimes. Do those plans turn into an intent? Sometimes. And those are the high riskers. And the best thing to do to help them is to secure their safety. You know, it, it, I don't think we're missing anything, GK. I think it's a balancing act. I understand these parents. These parents got two, the new full time is two jobs. You know, the economy is crazy. They come home, they're exhausted. The babysitter right now is the tablet or the phone. And I don't blame the parent because the parents got to cook now, pick up, do what they have to do to take care of the kids, take care of the household. So yeah, get here, get on Snapchat, get on YouTube while I take care of everything. By the time mom, dad's done doing what they have to do, it's like, it's time to go to bed. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a double-edged sword. You, you know what I mean? Well, but um, mm -hmm. yeah. It was a double-edged sword. Go ahead. 
Yeah, it's a double-edged sword, but this, the, the amount of screen time these kids are exposed to definitely fuels mood dysregulation. Um, and what makes it difficult with children is when a person's depressed or, you know, when they're distressed and they're contemplating suicide, they're, they're isolated. So it's hard to even pick up on their mood. You know, um, you can, you know, if you haven't heard from a friend in a long time, you can call and check up. Hey, everything okay? You haven't heard from you in a while. You know, we, we can do all those things. Um, but in my opinion, the best intervention is the uh, 988 number. You know, 24-7, 365 days of the year, you pick up that phone, you, you call them, it's confidential, and you, you will get the help. But that's one of the best interventions. And of course, you have um, CPEP, which plays a huge role in our community. I couldn't imagine Onondaga without CPEP, you know. Um, we have to contact community services uh, as well. I'm uh, talking about Abraham Hassan, a psychiatric nurse practitioner, and the name of your practice is? I view Psychiatric and P and Behavioral Therapy PC, but in short, I view PC. I view PC. So you, you talked about COVID. Mm -hmm. um, uh, with us paying more attention to, to mental health, um, you just re mentioned all the community resources that are available. Um and you said, you know, all you got to do is pick up the phone and call 988. And before I get to my question about that, you talked about screen time. And you know what I realized? And I, I, I read this somewhere a few years ago that because they, they, they just sitting down together as a family at least one to two nights a week was shown to be an effective deterrent to alcohol abuse and drug abuse. Now I might be over exaggerating that study, but without the screens, just being together around the table and I can, um, but something to that effect that sitting down together at dinner a couple of times a week seemed to have an impact on how much someone might be um, tempted to be uh, abusive in, in in substances or, 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 or abuse substances, if you will. And so my thought about is how do we make sure that the resources, the 988s, the people, whatever's available reaches black and brown folk as well, right? Who have historically not had access or haven't utilized it or haven't been encouraged to seek those mental health support services. Yeah. You know, and we've had this conversation in the past, GK. We've known each other for a while, but uh, education is 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 the key thing. Um, you know, there's depression, there's profound sadness, there's grief, there's PTSD, and they all look alike. You know what I'm saying? But what's going on in here in a person's mind is individual, is different and unique. But it all looks like manifested. You know, so we have to educate our community in regards to what mental wellness looks like, what mental illness looks like. You know, I've, I've had so many clients that thought that psychosis was normal and that everyone goes through that. You know, 19, 20, 21 years old, I had this one client who was, just had religious grandiosity and he was delusional. And um, his church was pumping him up saying, Oh, you're, you're enlightened. You're, you're mm -hmm. awake. Mm -hmm you're a child of Christ. I'm like, no, this kid is sick. This kid is sick. But, you know, because it's just a casual conversation, I, you know, I'll kind of throw this in there. Um, psychiatry without spirituality um, is less effective. You know, if there's some level of spirituality, there's, you know, psychiatry get more, more efficacious in helping people suffering from mood disorders. But anyway, going back to the question, it's education. We have to have um, panels in a community um, where people come in and ask questions. We have to educate people on what these medications actually are, what they actually do, because they're not happy pills. I, I could tell you that without pause of hesitation, they're not happy pills and they won't stop 
they won't change your circumstances. You know, if you're making poor decisions that lead to, uh, you know, circumstances that cause you distress, then you need to mitigate those poor uh, choices. But these pills won't take away the circumstances that surround you that may be causing you depression. You know, whether it's financial issues, marital issues, uh, help. No, it, it won't take that. What these medications do purely is help improve someone's functionality and decrease suicidal ideations, which based on evidence is not many medications that will decrease severe suicidal ideations. We have lithium, clozaril, and what's new to the market is ketamine. Mm -hmm. Ketamine. Ketamine is very promising, and we do uh, we do ketamine uh, treatments at, at our clinic as well. So where do we go from here? Because I'm concerned that we may not, uh, I'm, I'm concerned that we're missing something. You're saying, well, we're not really missing something. Okay, if we're not missing something, I'm thinking about, especially for our kids, also the impact of, in some pockets, um, neighborhood-related trauma, and and our response to that. So we talked about screens. We also talk about, I know we don't talk about this enough, but the impact of racism on uh, mm -hmm. uh, black and brown folk and the trauma associated with that. Probably something that many of us have tucked away and not talked about uh, right. and, and, and the little aggressions or microaggressions that happen. And I don't know if that is 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 something that uh, is, is a part of this, but you know, I was just, I, I was, before we got on this call, I, there was a video that in Georgia, in a daycare, you had children being fed and the white children were fed and the black children weren't like mm. they, the white and the white, and they, they, it was just a, 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 a just a, a live stream of, of the, oh, this is our kids at, at breakfast or lunch or whatever the meal time was. And the little black children were sitting there with nothing in front of them, and all the white children had food, and they were yeah. eating their food. And and I'm saying, so it starts there. So uh, I'm on a uh, I'm on a tangent now. No, it's okay. But but just trying to, I'm really trying to make sure that all of our community has all the resources that they need. You mentioned faith as a component, but what if that's not enough? I know that's controversial to say, but. How do we, as a community, support our young people mentally, emotionally, uh, and socially, socio-emotionally? Yeah. Socially, emotionally. So, is that, what is it? Social, emotional, right? Yeah. Now, so, you know, you, you, you're, you're, you're right on the money. You know, PTSD is um, severe in our communities. That's the obvious. And you're right. We are missing something here. What's not obvious is the personality disorder that PTSD tends to conjure up. And that personality disorder is borderline personality disorder. And our community, the black and brown community, that is not discussed very, you know, much. Mm -hmm. And borderline personality disorder, in my opinion, is what's fueling all this gun violence, all this reckless behavior, all this lack of self-love. Because if you look at the symptomology of borderline personality disorder, and, and you know, you look at the criteria, you see things such as easily annoyed and irritable, issues with identity, dramatic short duration mood shifts, reckless behavior, self-injurious behavior. And this could include drug use. This could include violence. You know, when you have a young man 14, 15 years old, and this is a true story, has a gun pointed to his head. And the first thing that comes out of his mouth is, I don't give a F, do it. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but that's passive suicide. Right, right, right. And that's reckless behavior. So what we're missing is the borderline personality disorder component in our community. And I'm telling you, it's a ripple effect. And when I say trauma, GK, I'm not just talking about, you know, straight trauma, you saw gun violence or you, right. you know, it's complex trauma. You know, maybe you didn't get validated enough as a child, right. maybe you were criticized as a child by your own parents, mm -hmm. complex trauma, you know, and it's continuous because they still live in that same household. But what that conjures up is borderline 
personality disorder. Another symptom of that real quick. So, you know, when when two people are in a, in a relationship and the one person in a relationship really doesn't want to be with them anymore, but yet doesn't know how to let go. And maybe domestic violence will come out of that. Controlling comes out of that and all that other stuff. You know, that's fear of abandonment. That happens very often in our community. That's a symptom of borderline personality disorder. And that's what, re what we really need to be talking about. Um, in Syracuse, I actually had I had a chance to talk to Tony, the Syracuse school superintendent. And we're actually writing a proposal to educate the school districts about not only trauma, because I, I feel like that's the obvious. It's the borderline personality disorder that the trauma is conjuring up. I think that abandonment piece is something really to look at. So just to state the obvious, what are some of the warning signs for suicide or suicide ideation that we can look for? We've heard things like, you know, completely more isolated, uh, um, you know, changes in routine, things of that nature, withdrawing. Yep. Um, what else do we need to think about in terms so, of? So all those things you said are correct. And that's when you want to jump in. You don't want to just sit back and observe, is this going to get worse? Is it going to get better? Or is this a phase? The best way to find out if someone is suicidal is to ask them straight out. Are you feeling suicidal? Are you thinking of harming yourself? You know, they're going to be honest. Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. Move forward. How do you plan to do it? They'll tell you their plan. And then I usually ask questions like, what's stopping you from doing it? If they can't answer that, that's high risk. Because usually what stops people is, oh, I got children. Oh, you know, Jesus, you know, uh, he'll punish me. Um, you know, there's a safety, there's a safety net. Oh, I couldn't do that to my parents. I would be afraid to ask that question. I don't know. That's a What's question. stopping you? Because to me, that's a provocation. It sounds that way. Yes. But remember, the suffering person, the suffering person, you don't need to provoke them. They're already heightened. They're already. Right. Okay. You're not, you're not exacerbating anything. You really want to know what's the safety net because that's going to be your ally. Okay. If this so person, when you hear the what's net, stopping you, then you want to amplify and 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 have more of that available to that individual. I, I got you. I got you. Sometimes is their pets. Oh, because I don't know who's going to take care of my animals. That's why I haven't done it. So we focus on animals, like you know, build relationships. They need you, so on and so on. Um. But again, as I mentioned earlier, the act of suicide, more often than not, is an impulsive act. The progression usually deals with mental illness, such as depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, OCD, PTSD. And then the, the impulsive part of it is circumstances. You might have lost your job. Um, you know, and you, you're having some financial distress. You don't know the way out. You know, um, you know, transgender is a hot topic um, that that's an interesting one. They're considered high risk because not only does the individual uh, want to, you know, they want to, you know, you know, transition, whether from male to female, female to male, you know, I again, I, I'm learning more and more in my profession as I do it and as I read. So you would think that, okay, they have relief now because I can't imagine being born a man, but my brain's telling me, no, you really are a woman. You know, I can't, I don't know. I can't imagine that. So you do the transition and you would think it gives them relief, but no, now they're dealing with a whole new set of issues. How society is going to look at them. How they're going to be judged? Are they going to be accepted? Blase, blase. So that's a very high risk population. Another high risk population are the substance use. Mm -hmm. The substance use. You know, remember, su you know, substance abuse is is so insidious. First of all, no one ever wakes up and says, "Today I want to be an addict." The shit fucking happens. Mm -hmm. Sorry for cursing. I'm sorry. The thing, you know, it happens. But what makes an addict really high risk is when a person starts to feel hopeless. Mm -hmm worthless we're in the red zone and an addict because an addict doesn't want to be an addict anymore they get mm -hmm. tired of being tired they get tired right. of running and running and they may have maybe a month two months of clean time and if they relapse 
that guilt that comes with that relapse will conjure up hopelessness, worthlessness. There's no hope for me. There's no cure for me. I'm going to go kill myself. It's another high risk population. All right. So um, what are some thoughts, closing thoughts on what we should be doing now? Um, what you would like to see this again, this, this, um, this, this abandonment piece is really, you know, really thinking about got me thinking because that might be something that we, we just, you, people don't even know how to identify that. Right. Got it. So, so because they don't know how to identify it, they're, they're lashing out or they're doing things, but that they really want to, they, they, they really don't know how to explain or express that that's actually what they're feeling, right? So. right? Right, yeah, you know, it's abandonment, it's fear of being alone. And I've seen that in so many toxic relationships, you know, and I'm just going to use guys because it's two men speaking. But, you know, the man steps out of his marriage, doesn't want to be married, but yet doesn't know how to let the wife go or right. for divorce because they fear being alone or abandoned. And that just causes so much distress. So yeah, abandonment is, 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 is a huge thing. Um, but you know, education is the key thing. No, you know, spread the information for the number nine, eight, eight, and just a, a quick little blur. On, I mean, they are, again, uh, ketamine has been promising, uh, for people who suffer from depression with suicidal ideations. Um, but I always like to share with people who, who are having suicide, suicide ideations that it's a permanent thing. Because remember, when someone's suicidal, they lost judgment. They lost insight. Mm -hmm. They got to kind of ground them. You're like, it's a permanent thing. Um, no one knows what happens after we die. I've never met anyone who's died and come back and discussed it. Mm -hmm. you know, but we know what the Bible speaks of and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. Tell them that the persons that will hurt most are the people that are alive because you're still someone's son. You're still someone's uncle. You're still someone's grandson or whatever the case may be. And those are the ones that are going to hurt for a very long time. Abraham Masara, owner, provider, I view psychiatric. Um, for people who are looking for mental health services, how do they get a hold of you? Yeah, you can go to uh, my website, www.iviewtelepsych.com. You can just swing by the office. We're open Monday through Saturday, but we relocated, George. I don't know if I told you that we have a bigger office. So we're at a 200 Gateway Park Drive, Building B, Syracuse, New York, 13212. And we're actually in the works of opening up a satellite clinic on the south side, like we had a couple uh, years ago before the pandemic shut that down. Um, so that's one thing, but I I'll leave it with this. And, I'm, you know, again, I'm not talking as a professional here, we're just having a conversation, but you, every human being must have a relationship with a higher power. That is so important. I know how I identify. I identify as a Christian. I believe in Jesus. I believe that Jesus, the son of God, a representation of God. Um, and sometimes a higher power fills that void, that emptiness, that fear of abandonment. Um, you know, if you've ever attended AA or NA or any of those anonymous groups, uh, step one is to realize you're powerless over this and that you have to give it up to a higher power and we know those 12 steps are very efficacious they work they, they help people get into remission but spirituality is so important and in our country we're kind of losing that we're losing that you know um, and again not preaching any specific religion because we don't know which one is the right religion i know what i believe in but you must believe in something greater than yourself all right, brother Abraham Masara, I view tell us tell us tell I view tell us psych dot com. And yeah. remember psych is spelled P S Y C H. I view tell us dot com <laughs> uh, for go. more information on the work that they do. I'm George Capache, inspiration for the nation. Don't forget the suicide uh, prevention hotline. 988. Yep, 988. Text. 888. You can call. They're right. there 
four seven three hundred sixty five. Right. They play a a very very important service. And, and of course, there's also contact community services in the community. Mm -hmm. All right, all Mr. right, Patrick, inspiration for the nation.